this took me like 30 years to figure out and I figured it out on this tour. So you might say, there's a cost to be paid in inequality for innovation. I don't think there is a universal solution to that problem because the problem keeps manifesting. It's, think about it as an eternal problem. Here, here's the problem. There's a set of problems that'll never go away. Now, what the problems are change, but the fact that there are problems never go away. Okay, the fact that you have to produce hierarchies to solve those problems never goes away. The fact that the hierarchies dispossess never goes away. But the details shift all the time. And so the whole reason that you need the political discussion is to take a look at the particulars of the hierarchies and the particulars of the dispossession and say, okay, well, now we need to shim it up here. And now we need to shim it up here. And now we need to adjust this. And now we need to adjust this. Because you can't come up with a final solution to those problems. I think that's partly why you have consciousness itself. You know, because... If you could automate the solution, imagine there was a permanent solution. Well, there's a permanent solution to breathing. You have a part of your brain that just breathes. You don't think about it. You don't adjust it. Well, you do a bit when you're talking, but you get my point. It's like problem taken care of. Well, there's other problems that are so fluid, like they're eternal problems, but they're so fluid in their detail that you need awareness and linguistic capacity to address them. And I would say the problem of Hierarchy and dispossession fit exactly into that category. It's illegal to induct anyone into the armed forces if they have an IQ of less than 83. And the reason for that is the, the, the armed forces, despite having every reason to draw the contradictory conclusion, has decided that there isn't a single thing that you can be trained to do in the military if you have an IQ of less than 83 that isn't positively counterproductive. That's 10% of the population. And the political dialogue is a continual discussion between the left and the right saying, well, you know, right. this hierarchy is getting a little too steep and a little too rigid. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and well, and that's for me, that's also the, the, the fundamental reason for the necessity of free speech. And so I'm not claiming that this is true, but it's suggestive. If you don't get your act together and you let yourself slide, then what kind of moves in to take the place of what you could have been is something that's really not good at all. Well, in case it needs to be said again, right. we're actually not allied with those people. But there's this old idea, an old religious idea. This is a good idea. God rules with two hands. Right hand is justice and the left hand is mercy. Justice means you get what you deserve. But the world can't survive that way because people are flawed and make mistakes. And if you only got exactly what you deserved, it would be a hell of a world. Right, because you'd be punished for every single mistake you make. You know, you'd be held accountable in a way that would be unbearable. So that has to be tempered with mercy. And, and so maybe the left is the, is the end of the distribution that tempers with mercy when, when it's functioning properly. But it can degenerate into that cane-like resentment of the, of the successful. And that's a danger. On the right, you have the opposite danger, which is, well... You know, you advance because of your competence, but then that can ossify, and so you want to hang on to that, that position even though you're no, your competence no longer justifies it. You don't allow them to masquerade as friendly, as friendly, innocent people. Let's bloody well make sure that it's a fair game, and so that people don't get locked out of movement forward because of arbitrary positions of power. Look, let's make the assumption I'm paraphrasing slightly, but let's make the assumption that we want to, as a society, we want to extract maximum useful economic value from talented people. So that's the goal, right? The goal isn't to put the ball in the net. The goal is to get excellent and to be invited to play. Something that works now might fail dreadfully in a month or two months. So your best strategy is skill and reciprocity. They may be they may be commensurate. You may be able to stack them on top of one another, but now and then they dissociate doesn't matter whether you win or lose, it matters how you play the game. I, I want to take this apart a little bit. So because you're self-conscious and because you're aware of the future, you're actually a community unto yourself. And if you're selfish and impulsive, all that means is that you're serving the person you are right now 
you know, in that impulsive way, but not the person you're going to be. And so that's not a good grounds for any sort of ethical behavior. And I see that if you serve yourself properly, there's no difference between that and serving your family properly and serving your community properly, that those things all mesh in a kind of a harmonious manner. There are organizations that aren't businesses that you can't just cram into the free market structure willy-nilly. There's absolutely nothing in what I've written that suggests that at all. The stories are um, erroneous in detail and right in pattern. That's Ridiculous. fine, you can go look it up yourself because the idea of truth is much older than the idea of objective truth. I would say that's a mythological truism. You're tormented by a problem. Think, oh God, I must have done something wrong. I should, I should, you know, do some soul searching. Oh.